Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Stefan Simeon, and um, I'm very happy to welcome you today at uh, Matokyo Talks uh, Issue 7. Uh, this is uh, part of a uh, Matsokyo initiative, uh, which is uh, composed of an architectural magazine initiated by Poster Architects and uh, by its academic counterpart, counterpart uh, our studio from uh, the University of Architecture and Urbanism in Bucharest, uh, led with uh, Emil Burba, Christy Borcan and myself. Uh, today, uh, we are very happy to welcome Gustav Jepsen uh, from Ra Architecture from Norway. Um, during uh, his presence uh, with us today is during um, the student project for seven, eight houses in the center of Bucharest as a, as a lecture that is useful for, um, for students and for uh, the debates, uh, the ongoing debates uh, inside the studios of uh, uh, Ion Minku second year. Uh, I want to say that uh, he has uh, very generously accepted to be part of the jury later on uh, in our studio this semester for an uh, intermediate ju jury for the, the mentioned project, uh, together with Floris de Bruin from GAFPA. Um, just a few words about uh, uh, RA Architecture, which is an Oslo-based practice architectural office established in 2017 by uh, Gustav and uh, by Sarita Poptani. Uh, and um, I just want, uh, Gustav, before I give you the shared screen, I, I just want to, uh, to emphasize um, uh, a few words which you put in your uh, about on the website of your uh, architecture, which I like very much. Um, you say that uh, each project is a unique opportunity, particularly to its context and purpose. And you talk about... Um, uh, inner urban areas sensitive to rural and archipelago environments, which is uh, very particular in itself, uh, as uh, our experience uh, is very different here in Bucharest. Um, but uh, and and what I uh, really appreciate also is about uh, how you say you explore uh, and you use these words to make architecture that is generous, opportunistic, and connected to its specific physical as well as its social and cultural settings. And um, um, I, I like this concept of uh, architect, uh, this idea that the architect is, is, is going to provide generous and uh, very uh, connected architecture to, to that site. And also opportunistic uh, is a very interesting word, which uh, in Romanian is uh, uh, more debatable, but in, in the French speaking uh, part of uh, Europe, uh, opportunistic is a very good word, very pragmatic and very well, uh, uh, be, uh, very well charged with significance. Uh, I want to uh, say the rules of uh, our lecture today to everybody. Please keep your webcams on and more especially the microphones off. It is very difficult for me to to walk around through the through, through the, the participants and find out who, um, who uh, has the microphone on. So please uh, uh, adjust to this new normality. So Gustav, now if you, if you want to start and uh, you can share the screen. Yeah, sure. That's everyone. One, one, one more question, uh, issue, sorry. If you have questions for everybody, please ask them in the chat area of uh, Zoom. And at the end, after Gustav, uh, finishes uh, uh, the presentation, uh, I will read, uh, I will read uh, the, the questions and we'll uh, get into the question and answer session. Thank you. All right, everyone here, hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Stefan, for inviting, uh, inviting me. It's a great uh, pleasure to be able to present to you all. And uh, also, I'm looking forward to see all the projects that you have done at the end of the semester grid. Uh, just to start to tell you a little bit about the practice, uh, we are quite young, uh, under 30, both, uh, me, both me and Sarita, who I started the practice with, uh, did it straight out of uh, architecture school. Uh, I studied in Copenhagen and Sarita in Helsinki. 
Uh, so maybe it was a little bit naive to start off with straight out of uh, school, but uh, we had an opportunity as we won a competition early on that then led to more projects. Uh, but anyways, I can honestly say that we are not really people that like to speak about our work. Uh, we are not really contemplating that what we do is something special. So this uh, opportunity to present to you all today and a few publications have, has given us the reason to stop and think a little bit uh, about what we are doing, uh, who we are, what the themes are that drives us and that drives our architecture. Um, so I've set up the lecture uh, in a little bit different way. Rather than just showing projects from the beginning to the end, I've organized the lecture by themes themes that have shown up regularly in conversations we have had regarding different projects as kind of a backbone, helping you to understand what we are doing, but also handling, helping us understand what we are doing. So it's kind of, one can say like principles that we strive to work after uh, in all our projects, more or less uh, successful. Uh, so we are quite a practical pro uh, pro practice. Uh, we are a big fan of hand sketching on tracing paper, model making. Uh, we kind of throw out all the sketches we do. Uh, so it's not, we're not really pretentious that everything needs to be beautiful all the time, but rather thinking through drawing and sketching and trying things out quickly and using sketching as a tool to communicate ideas. Um, and as I told earlier on, we see our work is very basic, really, like based on a set of conditions, you have a solution, a solution. So not trying to complicate things unnecessarily. We believe that the strongest uh, designs are well executed and, and managed to show, showcase qualities uh, through its simplicity and its, its uh, robustness. Uh, and instead, we try to find meaningful and creative ways that architectural design can contribute uh, in. Uh, try to find a quality in each project that we can base the design on. Uh, and we like to steer away from the conversations uh, that it's only about aesthetics. Uh, aesthetic, if you only talk about aesthetics, it becomes a lot of times very uh, superficial and, to be honest, a little bit boring. Uh, so we, we like to talk about the bigger uh, about themes and the bigger pictures. Um, uh, so the first theme that we look for in our projects is uh, connecting or connection, uh, and hopefully in more than one level. Uh, we are quite rooted in Scandinavia, uh, coming from Sweden. Uh, and Finland and uh, studying in Denmark and living now in uh, having a practice in Oslo, Norway. Uh, so we pretty much lived in all the Scandinavian capitals. So we're very based and rooted in, in, in Scandinavia. Uh, there are similar conditions in all these four countries, uh, light and breezy summers and long and dark uh, winters. Uh, so in November to like February, it's mostly like this. It's dark when you walk to work in the morning and dark when you come home from work uh, uh, again. So it's basically dark all the time. Uh, so light becomes a big uh, theme during these time, uh, times, letting uh, the light in. Um, and then it's like uh, somehow like the turn of a flick around this time in March, people come out of their shells. And obviously, if it wasn't for Corona, uh, starting talking to each other, uh, having a coffee together in the park. So it's kind of these extremes living in Scandinavia. Uh, it's kind of the same with the sauna culture we have going on here, uh, moving from the really hot sauna into the ice cold uh, water. Uh, so I think people generally like these uh, contrasts. Um, Uh, like we like the extreme somehow. Uh, so in a way, uh, the architecture here needs to handle both, both of this, the darkness and the cold and the lightness. Uh, maybe not hot summers, but uh, warm summers. Um, 
So this is an image of the Scandinavian archipelago, more specific the southern coast of, of Finland. But you find this type of environment all along the southern coast of Sweden and Norway and part of Denmark too. Uh, I show this image here to kind of set a tone uh, where we do, in what areas we do most of our work in or have done. Um, we don't really have big aspirations to become a really big office with lots of international projects uh, on a global market, but instead we believe that in order to design truly uh, to the um, context, one needs to understand it. And this requires the physical presence and the personal identif identification with the context to know the ins and outs uh, of the environment, uh, the temperature changes, uh, the wind, uh, the movement of the sun uh, in the winter versus the summer, etc. So in contrast to a rather universal approach to architecture, architecture that doesn't really have a base, and, and could be placed anywhere in the world, we try to be more situational and contextual with how we design. The first project that I would like to talk about regarding this theme of uh, connection is uh, Villa Amalia. It's a large summer house in the Finnish archipelago. And this is the specific site of the project. So the client owns this whole island and it's it's around 500 meters wide, so it takes uh, around 15 minutes to, um, to uh, walk around. Uh, and this is the setting of the island with the bare cliffs and the, these low uh, special archipelago pine trees uh, that can withstand very harsh conditions. Uh, you can see how they're almost formed uh, by the wind uh, here. So it's a, quite a harsh conditions on this island. Uh, and then you also have these uh, beautiful cliffs everywhere. So these are two really fantastic moments of natural beauty. Uh, so we try to be sensitive in when we relate the built form with the landscape, we're trying to work on that close uh, relationship between the ecology and the tectonics so that the projects are rooted uh, in its uh, context. Um, we got this project in a little bit of a different way than you normally get private work. The, the client actually wanted students uh, or young architects to design his summer house, which probably doesn't happen so much. Uh, so he contacted the Alto University where Sarita studied. And um, obviously a lot of students wanted to do this project. And uh, so it turned out into a small competition which we were happy enough uh, or lucky enough to win and got to work from the first sketch to final completion uh, about a year and a half ago. So this is one of the visuals that we did for that competition. Uh, going back to the theme of connecting the, uh, and relating the built form and the landscape. This was one of the first diagrams we made for the main concept of the design and also something we showed in that uh, competition. Instead of blasting the beautiful cliffs that I showed you, uh, we, we wanted to let the topography of, uh, decide the levels of the houses. So we carefully placed the different volumes to follow the terrain. We had this uh, maybe kind of a poetic idea that the build, when the building is finished, it should still feel like you're walking uh, over the, like the cliffs that was there from the beginning. Um, one quote that we read, or like we kind of came across quite early on was uh, a quote by Frank Lloyd Wright. And he said something like, the good building is not the one that hurts the landscape, but which the one that makes the landscape more beautiful uh, than it was before the building was built. So kind of meaning, is it possible to bring some qualities of the site that wasn't visible or thought of uh, before? So determined to lose as little of, as possible of the context, uh, the building's mass is carefully divided into five different dwellings that sits along, uh, along a trail. 
So instead of having like one big unit uh, that would be very intense and have a big footprint, uh, we decided to split the house into several different volumes uh, that are then also bridged uh, together with uh, terraces. So in, in a way, the building is not a closed object, but instead like a, a wall that weaves its way through and across the site. Uh, and the path that it, this building weaves its way is determined by spending a lot of time on the site, like locating the significant trees, uh, the prevailing winds, um, how the sun moves and, uh, and so forth. So in a way, the building finds its way through the least, uh, the path of least resistance uh, through and over the site. Uh, but also like creating this connection between inside and outside uh, moving through, uh, through the house. So this is a um, section of how it works in real life for the main, for the main house. So th this is this uh, uh, volume here. So here you have the kitchen, dining room, and the living room. So it's, it's one big space, but then the zones are then divided by the level uh, differences. And the level differences are decided by the terrain. So it's all kind of connected. And then the same way, the roof, the form of the roof is also decided by uh, the uh, topography. Uh, so the, you have pretty much the same slope on the roof as you do with the typography. Uh, yeah, like so here is uh, then the shelf dividing the uh, dining room to the kitchen and then with good views over the archipelago environment. And similarly, uh, this is how it sits on top of the cliffs. Uh, sits very kind of lightly on the ground. Uh, and then here are the stair that will showcasing the different levels and also the, uh, the fireplace between the kitchen and the living room. So that is yeah, here. So this is a view of the house uh, from the Southwest side. We like to be quite humble uh, towards the context and we do that by having a quite modest architectural language rather than trying to compete with the existing beauty uh, with some kind of strong forms and uh, kind of look at me attitude with architecture. We, instead, we try to be blend in and be respectful uh, of the nature and the history. So in other words, kind of aim for the landscape to stand out and uh, not the building. Uh, and for that reason, uh, we always try to find the right scale, uh, and that's not always very easy. Uh, clients tend to have as large of a house as possible, uh, even though site, the site can't always handle it. So it's a lot of effort that, that went into uh, talking about the client uh, about this, uh, what is the right scale. Uh, for the building, uh, something that you want to see in the final uh, images, but a lot of effort uh, went uh, in uh, when uh, talking about this. So here is um, here are the big trees, some of the big trees that we uh, that we uh, mapped out early on, and uh, and in, in a way camouflaging uh, the villa. Uh, and the horizontal uh, of the roof here also kind of expressing the hor horizon of the, of the ocean. Um, and this is a photo of the northern point of the island. Uh, we ended up choosing a dark color of the house to make the house blend in as much as uh, possible into the setting, uh, which is actually, you think that a gray house would blend in with the, the cliffs and the, and the nature, but a dark color actually blends in much, much better. Um, another theme that we try to work after uh, is to create spaces that are as efficient as possible. 
not maybe through mechanical systems, but through a carefully designed and efficient plan. Uh, the, the, because the compactness of the plan, uh, plan introduces one of the common places of ecologi ecological designs, uh, and that is uh, avoiding waste. And also every square meter of a building costs uh, money for the client. So this is actually uh, where we as architects can really impact the cost of the project. Uh, our experience is that clients usually obviously want uh, as big as possible with the least amount of money. But could one, for example, uh, design a house that is 30 square meters smaller without affecting the comforts and the luxury of the house? Uh, then you actually save about 100,000 euros uh, in construction costs uh, based on the amount of the money it costs to build here in, in Norway, which is uh, quite expensive because the, the walls are like 400 millimeters thick uh, because of all the regulations. Um, and so, so kind of save that money and use that on more robust and timeless materials. Uh, so this is something we talk a lot about in the office. Uh, where does the money go to go into and how to make the most out of it? Uh, so sometimes it's worth saving a couple of square meters in order to get really nice quality materials. One great example of this is uh, the Sverre Fien uh, Echo House. So Sverre Fien is uh, uh, one of the Norwegian masters. Uh, he had designed, for example, the Nordic Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, and, which, I, which you might be familiar with. Uh, but he also did this uh, competition for a large vacation home uh, developing, uh, development, uh, consisting of about 100 of these uh, small uh, homes. Uh, all of the houses uh, were nearly exact the same plan. It never ended up uh, getting built to a full extent, but they did some mock-ups and uh, tested this house. Uh, and I show this because it has a really beautiful plan and efficient and uh, efficient plan. So you have this spine here with, uh, uh, with the living and dining. So it, it's sort of like the, the, spa, uh, the kitchen is also part of the corridor, but it's also part of the uh, living and dining with, separated with a fireplace. And then you have the bathroom that's also part of the corridor and, uh, and this outdoor terrace that doesn't add extra square meters, but add a quality to the home in the way that you can extend the, the living room or the bedroom uh, to become a, a bigger space. And then you have this uh, outdoor toilet, which is quite a, a common thing for Norwegian uh, holiday homes to have it out, outside because that's uh, you usually spend uh, in the summers most of your time out, outside. Uh, so yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful plan. Uh, so similar, we try the same concept with this beach house that on the same island as the villa, uh, I just uh, showed images of earlier, but this is a beach house that is right next to the ocean. So with this plan, uh, we wanted to maximize the usable, usable space, avoiding corridors. Yeah, so here the corridors are also the bedroom nooks. Uh, so it's actually a three bedroom house in like 55 square meters and it sleeps six people and has uh, two bathrooms and uh, so it's kind of looking at that efficiency and like making the most the, like yeah having the most qualities with the least amount of space uh, so here you also have the uh, an outdoor kitchen that becomes an indoor kitchen becomes a bench and a wardrobe along like a spine in the back and then more open up towards the ocean and uh, towards the sun. Uh, so here is a photo of, of this uh, core, like looking this way, with the kitchen and the ocean towards the left here. Um, and here is the image of the bunk beds. So we looked a little bit about on like efficient boat interiors, like how much space do you actually need 
to have a quality bed and uh, stuff. So, so it's all quite efficient. Uh, similarly, we try the same thing with the large summer house uh, that I showed earlier on. Uh, so here's the plan of the house uh, with the living kitchen dining and then the bedroom uh, volumes along here. Um, so by splitting the house up into different volumes, it actually turned out to be really, really good in terms of the efficiency of the plan because then you avoid uh, corridors um, whatsoever because all the corridors are outside. Uh, so it's, it's all about the different uh, rooms. And, and by having the corridors outside, the surrounding nature also becomes a part of the experience of living and moving through the house. So it makes the house feel much bigger than it actually is. Um, but it also makes uh, having these, it creates these terraces so for all times of the day that you wouldn't get maybe from having a, more of a single object. Uh, but also by having these uh, narrow volumes, it's, it's also like you never done more than a few steps out. So uh, and that is what is, uh, is because uh, Scandinavia celebrate the outdoor life in the summer because of the really dark and cold winter. So we like uh, this idea of emphasizing these qualities and make the most out of it. Um, and I think that was in part of why we won the competition also. Uh, oh, so natural qualities like uh, sitting under the pergola in the low evening, evening sun. Similarly, we thought uh, about this in this cabin uh, to create a compact house with the same idea of minimizing corridor, corridors, but still having a good flow in and around the house. Uh, unfortunately, this one didn't end up getting built. Uh, but I, I still want to show it because it has some qualities in it. Uh, so it's basically made out of, out of these four wall sections with corner windows. Uh, and then, then the house is lowered down a little bit, uh, making the perimeter of the house into one uh, continuous piece of fixed furniture. So from seating into shelves, into seating again, maybe a little bit more narrow seating, narrow shelves into the entryway. So it's like one, one continuous uh, piece of furniture all the way around. And the client wanted this communal way of living, which I think it offers because it's, it is a, quite an open plan, but it still has the possibility to be able to close off and create this. Uh, privacy uh, we, uh, in the different bedrooms. Uh, yeah, so this is how uh, the cabin sits on the ground with the large eaves, uh, kind of enables uh, the interior to kind of flow out uh, outwards even more. Uh, and uh, yeah, big fireplace in the middle, yeah. And this is then a, a view of the inside dining, dining room uh, with the bench that with the storage underneath that turns into the shelf and as one continuous thing. Uh, in terms of the materials, it's quite basic, uh, really just massive timber uh, or more specifically pine. Um, very uncomplicated and this brings, uh, brings us to the next theme, theme, which I would like to discuss, uh, which is about the robustness and clarity. We strive for our work to be quite simple and direct. We are more interested in the building systems and creative ways, creating ways of dealing with spatial conditions rather than over, over elaborate on uh, finishings and uh, complex detailing. Uh, 
the, the, the less ways a building can be messed up, uh, the usually the better, especially, especially now on, because we are quite early on in our careers, we don't have the knowledge to do things in completely new ways. And we don't really want to take the risks of doing that either. So I think it's about doing things carefully and well executed rather than coming up with new, uh, new systems. And the office name uh, RAW uh, is in English RAW, uh, which stands for this idea of no fuss, uncomplicated, not overly polished uh, designs. So this is an image of a house, uh, the house at Big Hill by Kirsten Thompson Architects. And I was lucky enough to be able to work at her office uh, after finishing my bachelor's. And a lot of this thinking about clarity and robustness comes from her. Uh, Kirsten Thompson is a fantastic architect and you should really look at some of her buildings. Uh, she's really in that forefront of letting the materials speak for herself and create these beautiful uh, uncomplicated uh, spaces. Uh, these are some photos of a cement wall for a shower room in a, in a sauna we designed, uh, exposing that rough surface and texture with the soft light hitting the wall uh, can create some really nice moments. So how a material uh, stimulate our senses is a very, a very important source of inspiration for us, like these haptic uh, characteristics like the scent of the fresh wood or the feeling when you touch a, a smooth uh, concrete uh, surface. Uh, and th this is something that's very easily forgotten, and, uh, but something that I think is very, very important in architecture. Um, at the same time, we are interested in the effect of weathering materials, especially wood. Uh, and to use weathering as a technique for the materials to harmonize with the hues and tones of what you found in the, uh, found in the surroundings. For example, the hues and tones uh, of these bricks in relationship to the ground, but also kind of creating a depth in the brick wall. Uh, a depth that you will be able to, that you can find in the nature. Uh, I think this brick wall would look way more imposed if it was just a flat surface. So uh, just like kind of looking at nature and what, how can you respond to that? Uh, for example, the concrete of the outdoor kitchen reflecting the blueness of the water and the sky. Or the same concrete, but then reflecting uh, having that as a staircase, kind of an extension of, uh, of the cliffs. So this is uh, the house in Bergen uh, that we are designing at the moment. Um, uh, and it's made out of this cross laminated uh, timber construction. Uh, method. So, and here, here again, it's about letting the materials be their own thing. It's not about hiding elements, but just like kind of letting it be, uh, not polish uh, things. I think we think that a building should become better with age. For example, the choice of using massive wood planks in a humid archipelago environment with large temperature differences. Uh, could be seen as a very stupid choice. But, but then if you think about the movement of the timber uh, planks and cracks as something beautiful, as something that gives the house a sense of a timeless character, uh, does, does it matter that there are some cracks in the floor uh, in a room like this? Uh, I think it, personally, I don't think so. And I think it's actually just nice and, and it, it brings that, that level of timelessness and character that, 
like a plaster wall would never uh, never bring. Something that goes along with the theme of no nonsense and clarity is thinking about the way a building goes together and doing that early on in the design process, the, the te tectonics of the designs. Actually, I think this is uh, quite interesting. Uh, Norway, pre-oil and the whole kind of boom that happened because of the, they found oil in the North Sea in the 70s. Norway was actually quite a poor country. So uh, this is a structure of an old Norwegian stable for maybe like 100 years ago. And you can see here that the columns and beams are just as wide uh, as they need to be, not any wasted material. And I think we like this idea of thinking about the structure in this way, uh, striving for architecture, uh, structural clarity, like where there is not any, the beams are not bigger dimension than they need to be, and they are placed where they should be. Uh, so the tectonics of the designs focusing, focuses on how uh, st structures itself, it's the, is an artistic goal. Uh, and this really makes uh, sustainable and economical sense and also gives a good framework to start from. One architect uh, office that really nailed, have nailed this is uh, Lakaton Passat. And so great that they won the Pitsuka Prize this year. So Latapi House, which is this house here, is a, is a uh, house that I did a study on maybe, I think it was like the second year of architecture school. And it was a big eye-opener uh, that, that is actually possible to design in this way. Uh, and it's kind of been in the back of my mind since then. Um, I think another architect that thinks about this a lot is the architect uh, Arno Frick. It's a Swedish architect and I think he's worth uh, looking up also, uh, Arno Frick. Um, so looking at how you can optimize the economy with uh, prefab systems. Uh, so it's not in a way about the perfect, uh, perfectionizing the details, but rather how to put things together in, in the most effective way and reducing elements. So in other words, trying to make architecture where consultants doesn't need to rip their hair to produce. Uh, I think that's uh, quite a nice way of thinking about it. Um, uh, so we are working on a house at the moment, uh, together with, uh, uh, with another office, the Strom Architects. And, uh, wait, sorry. Um, and yeah, so it's uh, situated right on the border between uh, Sweden and Norway, and it has this um, L-shaped form, uh, so open up to more of a yeah, communal garden, southwest-facing uh, garden. Um, so it's, it's based on the um, uh, with a laminated timber structure uh, with a 1.8 meter grid that then can easily be divided into a CC60 stud work. And then just having two or three different types of windows in all in order to kind of simplify the process and the economics of this project uh, as much as possible. And here is a, yeah, and then using this grid as uh, separation to different for different rooms, so quite an open kitchen living area, more of a uh, down here, and then more of a like a private wing with the bedroom master suite, getting the morning sun and the a guest area uh, on this side here. Um, so we like to use the structure to ex express certain elements in the design. So for example, the desk in between uh, two columns or, or a bench, 
that can be used as a kind of a reading nook. And again, using that like corridor uh, and having that as more like giving it a program, not just the corridor. And then this is the view of the living room. Again, like showing the structures on the inside, inside because this house is about the structure. So it's not about hi hiding things, but rather expressing this, uh, the structure as an important element of the design. Um, and this is, and uh, this is uh, the bedroom. So it also gives you kind of possibilities to play with the uh, window settings. Like for example, you can imagine waking up here and uh, looking at the birds flying uh, in the sky above you, uh, getting some morning sun. Uh, yeah, we also do some open competitions, uh, which we uh, we tend to lose them. Uh, this uh, one is, uh, for example, the National Log and Wetter Museum, uh, which is a short drive from Oslo. Uh, I show this, uh, this building here because it has a kind of a clear lineage to the previous house. Uh, similarly, we looked at the structures as a starting point and the framework of the design. So having quite an open structure with large uh, spans, uh, to free up the museum floor for flexible usage. Uh, but then at the same time, using this structure to kind of create this mezzanine, uh, yeah, second floor that, that uh, overlooks the, for classroom that overlooks the museum below. Uh, we have done this type of uh, axonometric, axonometric uh, diagrammatic drawings. Uh, uh, quite a lot of time and I, I, we like them because it shows several layers of the design uh, how it's built it shows the plan how it sits in the context uh, how it's kind of used and occupied so it's, i think it's a very communicative way of showing architecture um, and we like to do this when we when we have the time to do it so here is the plan of the first floor of the museum. So as you can see, is the, the open spans with the boxes kind of sitting in between uh, the structure. Uh, and then, yeah, so it's kind of about the museum being in between these programmed uh, spaces and the boxes. And then you have this uh, kind of separate entity that hosts all the functions for the museum that's so kind of, yeah, putting all the effort into this uh, museum and like just kind of putting all the things that needs to be there away. And yeah, here's the second floor of the museum with, with the mezzanine overlooking the museum below. And then uh, the entry kind of also showcasing the, the structure on the inside also. So it's also visible on the outside. Uh, also, also about this idea of not hiding and uh, being honest. Uh, yeah, here's the inside with the mezzanine and the boxes between the large open surface of the museum and then the, the entry space uh, showing this. Because it's a log and wetland museum, we wanted to showcase this. Uh, uh, very much in, as the first thing you notice and think about when you walk into the museum. But well, we did not win, but uh, that's how it is when you have uh, hundreds of proposals. Um, I think the next thing I want to, or like the last thing I want to talk about uh, is, uh, is curiosity uh, about wanting to learn new things as a young office and also like as students as you are. Uh, everything is new and sometimes it's kind of daunting to think about everything we need to know. Uh, but in a way we are lucky because architects tend to be young and promising until they are 50. So we have all the time in our hands. 
uh, the way we think about it or what we uh, try to do is to learn something new in all our projects. It could be researching a new system, uh, a new building method or a new material. Um, I think it's very easy to be stuck and do uh, what you have done before because that's what the thing that comes natural uh, because it requires less uh, time and effort. Uh, but by having this idea that a new project should also bring a new knowledge uh, makes the whole profession seem easier to grasp. Uh, so, for example, we are experts in building stilts, uh, like building on stilts on a rock formation. Uh, but we didn't have a clue uh, how to use in situ concrete um, for uh, this uh, stair shaft in, in the house in Bergen. Uh, so hopefully by the age of 50, we have kind of built up this uh, catalog of knowledge uh, that we can, and then also like building up the slowly, also and steadily building up the database and the, uh, in the office of all sorts of different uh, uh, yeah, way and things come together. And yeah, that's kind of how we like to think about it. Uh, yeah, speaking about this house in Bergen, for us, it was a little bit like starting from scratch again, because the site posted a series of new challenges that we hadn't faced before. It was a big, it's a big level difference between the upper part of the site to the lower part. Uh, so that required a different foundation and also like kind of working with quite limited access to the site. Um, so it's, it's kind of like starting from scratch again. Uh, um, and, but the house is located, uh, like, as I said, like uh, outside uh, the city of Bergen, um, uh, overlooking west facing overlooking a beautiful fjord below. So this, is, this is kind of the um, scene. Uh, took the photo like the first day of the site visit. Uh, and the spatial concept of the villa is based on the division of a more closed concrete uh, structured ground floor uh, that consists mainly of the bedroom function and then more of an open plan upper floor uh, where the main living areas are located. Uh, and then this long house that kind of ends in this uh, winter garden, which is a uh, like a lush green space that also acts as like the transition space between the two floors. Um, again, we've thought about the material choices as kind of like the concrete reflecting the cliffs nearby and the timber uh, top with the wood lawn and the, the trees around it. So here's the section of of the house with the winter garden as this lush transition between the two floors. Uh, but the winter garden also has this way of like kind of, as I talked earlier on with in, in Norway uh, or Scandinavia, that it is uh, a cold and dark winter. So having this winter garden also kind of extends the summer uh, more into the, into, the, into the other seasons uh, and the darker months of the year. Um, yeah, this is just a kind of a quick render of the winter garden um, with its transition, uh, the staircase and kind of the raw steel mezzanine uh, above and uh, an image of the study um, with a desk overlooking, looking into the uh, winter garden and uh, kind of bringing that nature into the house. Um, yeah, so to kind of give a summary of what I've been talking about in terms of these themes, in a way, we don't find architectural form uh, in itself so interesting, but rather the, the relationship uh, between the form, the context, the content, the, the construction method and the materials, and like the possibility to kind of integrate all of this into a whole. Uh, so these are kind of the themes that 
we strive for in our work at the moment. It could be that it's changed in the future. But at the moment, we like our built programs to take on simple geometries, uh, restrained materials, and instead focus on uh, spatial conditions and clarity and durability. Uh, we don't consider us a very theoretical practice. We, we rather pursue architecture through a more hands-on approach. So practical in a way. Uh, we, tr we find it important to try uh, things out and ideas out in reality and focus on the built work. Um, so I kind of end with this kind of uh, Scandinavians are a little bit uh, hesitant to make statements. Uh, we have this saying in Nordic countries, everything, everybody's looking for the balance between the not too bold or not too fancy. And I think that's kind of a rather nice saying indeed. It's like striving for the average rather than the extreme. So this mentally, I think I played a large role in the, the way we have done our work and uh, may, might could be seen in the what I've shown here uh, during the lecture. I think, yeah, I think uh, that's uh, that's it for the, the lecture. Welcome. Thank Have you. Some questions? Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Gustav, for the beautiful lecture. And uh, yes, we have a few questions, which I'm going to, to ask uh, yeah. to read them. Uh, you, you can also see them in the chat area if you, you need to, uh, to, to see them written. Yeah. So I, I'm going to start uh, in a chronological order of appearance of the questions. And then at the end, I also will add uh, uh, one or two of myself. So from Ovidio, how early or how late does the 3D modeling stage enter your design process? Ooh. I think uh, we like to kind of make the basic plan and study the site, uh, first of all. Um, I think we, we do a 3D model uh, also, um, usually quite a rough 3D model, and then we'd like to do uh, do a physical model of it, but uh, uh, pretty much within the first uh, week or the first two weeks, we start to uh, probably have a, a basic and, 3D model. And the models, the physical models, what uh, what material are, are you working uh, with? Uh, I think uh, we like things that are quick and easy. So uh, we have a phone cutter at the office. Mm -hmm. and I think that is a very handy mm -hmm. way of just trying things out quickly. Yeah. Um, passing to the next question, I will uh, say that the lecture will be available on our website on Matsokyo. You, you can go to the Matsokyo talks section. We, it will be av available in a few days, probably. Uh, how from Irina, how did you choose the practice for internship after finishing bachelor's? As uh, many students approach this moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I studied my bachelor in, in Melbourne in, in Australia. So uh, then my teacher actually uh, recommended me to, to Kirsten Thompson Architects. So, so it was way through my, through my teacher. Um, uh, but I think uh, generally, I think it's better to call up different offices rather than send emails. Uh, they tend to be, you tend to get a lot of emails. So uh, uh, as a kind of a suggestion, I would say to just call up and mm -hmm. don't be shy. So you have also started uh, receiving such applications? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah. Um, from Maria. What other qualities in terms of atmosphere do the exterior corridors have besides the economical point of view? Yeah, well, uh, I think it's I think it's about that like kind of kind of being exposed to the different elements. Mm -hmm. um, as the, the client was uh, quite a he worked he's a lawyer working in London and Luxembourg, living in this like kind of hectic big big city. So we wanted to offer kind of a different, uh, an alternative way of living. So uh, 
So that was kind of, I think that are, those are the main uh, qualities that uh, having external. Yeah. And I, I wanted to add to this question uh, myself. Uh, you you uh, talked about uh, this going from one part of the house to the other by the outside. Mm. And I was thinking, how does this uh, inner circulation works in Norway when it's cold and you must go outside uh, <laughs> during uh, evening? I, I was thinking that also to the Sverefen house, you know, with the bathroom. Uh, yeah, well, outside. yeah. Uh... Well, it's um, uh, it is a summer house, so it's uh, it's uh, it's supposed to be mainly used in the summer. Okay. Um, but um, but I actually got a text from the client here in, for this house, um, and they were there celebrating uh, celebrating uh, Christmas and New Year's, and he said it was a little bit cold, but uh, but uh, I guess. Uh, mm -hmm. You, you make sure to take the stuff when you uh, when you move through, so you don't have to end up going. Yeah, and uh, just to 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 uh, add up, uh, what are the local regulations in terms of uh, insulation of thermal insulation? Just as a curiosity, uh, how much how much insulation do you put in walls in roof? Well, it's 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 hard to make the exterior shell less than 400 mil um, like maybe you can get down to 320 if you uh, yeah. but uh, basically like 200 250 millimeters of insulation that's uh, what's uh, required yeah um, from andrea uh, what programs do you use for 3d modeling and rendering uh, we use uh, we use both ARCHICAD and uh, Rhino, mm -hmm. and uh, I think rendering is uh, Enscape, mm. and uh, I think I am so happy with Enscape really. Like uh, I remember back in being a student and taking twenty four hours to produce one render, and now you can do it in three seconds. Like, yeah. What a luxury! I think here in Bucharest is uh, SketchUp very very uh, well used. Yeah. Yes. Um, from Alex and Vlad, regarding robustness and clarity, yeah. and your affirmation that as a young architect you prefer not taking risks. Why? And do you think that should be the case for every young architect? I ask. I ask because I currently see uh, the early years in the profession as the period of experiment and risk. Well, I think uh, it's a, he definitely has a point in that. Uh, I think what I mean with taking risks is, is in terms of more like the, the way uh, that building comes together as a more of a like kind of waterproofing and all of those kind of things. Uh, I think you definitely should take risks in kind of coming up with crazy concepts. Uh, but maybe, and if you are really good at detailing, you should, you could do, figure out some fancy details, but uh, I think Architecture is such a um, kind of big, big uh, kind of profession. So uh, you don't know everything, and uh, just taking taking it step by step. I I, I think it's quite yeah. nice. And uh, I would also like to add that um, I think it's a very delicate and uh, important moment when you go from uh, projects as students. A student to uh, feeling uh, the, the the responsibility as an architect that uh, deals with the budget and clients is very difficult uh, to imagine what it is on the other side. I mean, um, but very good question. Yeah, uh, and Ma and Marcella, Marcella, thanks you very much for the lecture, and uh, <laughs> she appreciates very, very much your work, and she she has written this, she, she has shared that with us. Um, so these were the questions. I would like to also add uh, uh, two questions. One is about uh, if you can say something to us about this very particular relationship between furniture and architecture, with, which uh, to me it seems that uh, Scandinavians, Scandinavian architecture is very, very um, uh, good in, at that. And it's a big theme in uh, working with built-in uh, furniture and transport 
transforming it into architecture uh, furniture. It has a very good tradition. Yeah, I think that is a really interesting question. And uh, uh, also in a way, uh, something that we think about a lot. Uh, also in the word, way that efficient plants usually have built-in furniture because that's how to make it as efficient as possible. I think um, I, I put this uh, image up here now because um, it's kind of represent what we try to strive after with our built-in furniture. We, I think the, the, the more things uh, the furniture can, furnishing can be, the better. So it, could, it, could it, it's, it's a bench, but it's also like the window frame and it's also a shelf. So if we try for the things to be more than one thing, like could a fireplace also be a bench and uh, a place to kind of store the logs. So it's so rather than it's just one fireplace, it's actually more things. And that's when you can be creative in the way you, you design uh, sites, uh, like very specific sites. Yeah. And uh, my last question, uh, I, I have noticed that uh, you are part of an organization, of association, of, uh, uh, of offices, of architecture. And I was curious uh, if you could give us the background. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, yeah. so uh, we sit here in a, like in a shared office space. It's uh, in central Oslo. So it's shared between uh, 10 different young architecture offices. So uh, in a way it's very handy because it's, there is always someone who has been into a problem that you, uh, that you need to ask about or that, uh, and maybe you have experience in doing something mm -hmm. that they don't. So we all have separate rooms, but we do share knowledge and uh, kind of share, uh, have some smaller lectures and eat lunch together and, and so forth. So I think if you, if you decide to start your own practice, I think having that community around you or kind of practice uh, gathering up with an existing office, I think it's a really great, uh, great way of starting. Thank you, Gustav. Thank you for uh, the lecture and for your answers. And um, thank you everybody for attending to uh, Matsokyo 7, Matsokyo Talks 7. And uh, we're looking forward to meet you again uh, for the uh, intermediate jury, which will be in uh, two, three weeks, I, uh, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Yes, likewise. Bye everybody.